A few weeks ago, I attended an online Shiva Minion for the father of a friend. Rabbi Jill Hammer shared a teaching about the mourner's Kaddish that really touched me. She said, we recite Kaddish as a way of stitching together the worlds. We recite Kaddish as a way of stitching together the worlds as a way of bringing our loved ones to be present with us in this world, in our hearts, in our minds, as a way of keeping them close for a few moments each day, each festival, each year. Liturgically, Kaddish functions as a seam that separates and stitches together the different parts of our prayer services. It was initially recited upon leaving the house of study a bridge between study, prayer, and action, an intention for weaving Torah into life beyond the Beit Midrash. Just after Purim, we moved our congregation's activities from Spruce Street to BZBI online. As our community members have lost loved ones, parents and partners, throughout the pandemic, as we have marked yard sites, we have logged on to Zoom to pray together and to recite Kaddish. Each minion, I've been wowed by the mystery and the miracle, the surprising intimacy of coming together online. And I have ached for the physical presence of others for which there is no substitute. We gather each of us in our own homes our own little boxes sewn together by code, strings of zeros and ones. Please unmute yourselves, we request when it comes time for Kaddish. Let us know you are here, present with those in mourning. As we answer, Amen, we do what we can to stitch together the worlds. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we read, La Col. A season is set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven. A time for rending and a time for stitching. In Jewish tradition, we have a custom of kriya, of tearing a garment to mark loss as a physical expression of grief. This custom dates back to our Near Eastern ancestors. In the Tanakh, Jacob tears his garment when he fears his beloved son, Joseph, has died. David tears his cloak when he learns of the death of his beloved friend, Jonathan. Job tears his clothing when he learns that all of his beloved children are gone. In our biblical narratives, the rending of a garment in grief is seen not only as a response to the death of a close relative, but as a response to a variety of life-altering losses and traumas. Joshua tears his garment in response to Israel's blasphemy and betrayal. Tamar tears her cloak after surviving a sexual assault. Mordechai tears his clothing upon hearing that the Jewish people are slated for destruction. When we face an excruciating loss, the, the tear is a sign on the outside that mirrors the rupture we feel on the inside. This past summer, I had the privilege of studying about the ritual of Kriya with Rabbi Malila Helner Eshed of the Shalom Hartman Institute. She taught that tearing our garments in mourning is about the end, the final tear that separates between the living and their beloved that has just died. It is the tear between the living and the dead that cannot be mended, not in crude stitching or basting, and not in beautiful embroidery, at least not in the beginning. 
Kriya is the time for tearing and shattering. There will yet come days for mending and healing. But now the heart is wide open and the tear is real and it creates a roaring abyss. The heart is torn open in the great mystery of life and death. These days, we are all trying so hard to hold it together, to stitch together the worlds that have been torn asunder by the pandemic. But have we adequately expressed our grief at the magnitude of loss we have sustained. Nearly one million people around the world gone. In our country, over 200,000 lives lost. Have we taken the time for tearing? La col zman. For everything, there is a time. Et li croa ve'et for a time to tear and a time to sew. The world needs face masks, we read in the headlines in March. There was a shortage of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers around the country, around the globe. It was a spring of anguish, of isolation and separation. Families of COVID patients connected with loved ones only over iPads, nurses and doctors tried to bring comfort to those who were dying alone. And this is still happening. And back in March, a call went out to all people with sewing skills to make masks for those on the front lines fighting the lethal novel coronavirus. A number of members of our BZBI community and friends in our neighborhood got to work cutting cloth, moving needles in and out, pushing pedals on sewing machines. A wartime effort to provide protection for those at risk, to maintain connection, a stitching together of worlds. After Pesach, Yosef and the kids and I spent an unexpected blessing of a month in my childhood home, potting with my parents in Plainsboro, New Jersey. Rummaging in the basement, I found a stuffed pig pillow I had sewn from a pattern in life skills class in middle school. In seventh grade, Mrs. Kempler taught us how to sew, how to reattach buttons that had come loose from shirts. Mrs. Kempler was from Brooklyn. She was wonderful, and I can still hear her saying the word seam ripper. I remember how she'd say, if Mrs. Kempler tells you that you have to use the seam ripper, that's a bad thing. My great-grandfather, Ephraim, escaped conscription in the Tsar's army in Poland. He became a tailor in Lansing, Michigan. My own sewing skills never progressed beyond the seventh grade. During this season leading up to Yom Kippur, for centuries, Jewish women in Eastern Europe would bring balls of cotton thread to the cemetery. And they would encircle the graves where loved ones were buried with string. They would take the thread home and turn it into wicks for candles. They would then donate these candles to the base medrash, the house of study, to provide light on Yom Kippur. While laying the wicks, women would recite trinas, prayers and supplications, seeking atonement. They would call on ancestors, those who had already died, the generations who came before, all the way back to the matriarchs and patriarchs, even Adam and Eve, to awaken God's mercy, to intercede on their behalf so that they would be sealed in for a year of life touching the thread to the earth, sending up prayers, transforming string to smoke. For generations, our ancestors have been stitching together the worlds. La kol zman, for everything, a time. Et li et li kroa, a time to sew and a time to rend. And as we stitch, have we taken the time for tearing? If we were to light a Yartzeit candle for each of the more than 204,000 individuals who have died of COVID-19 in our country, if we took five seconds to light each candle, 
it would take nearly 12 continuous days and nights to light all the candles. If we were to tear three inches of cloth for each life lost, that tear would stretch all the way from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. Rabbi Elliot Kukla, a hospice chaplain with the Bay Area Jewish Healing Center, wrote last month in the foreword that there is a cavernous absence of public grieving for the momentous losses we are all facing in 2020. He argues that this is because early on our country adopted a convenient and false narrative that COVID kills only those who are elderly with compromised health, people on the margins. It has disproportionately affected black and brown and poor Americans, those whose lives are devalued in our society. And as such, as a nation, we have allowed ourselves to avoid properly mourning our collective loss of hundreds of thousands of people of all ages and all races and classes and abilities. A death toll comparable to the entire population of the city of Rochester, New York. Rabbi Kukla cautions us, mourning is humanizing and its absence cracks open the door to atrocities. Mourning is humanizing. Its absence cracks open the door to atrocities. To grieve a loss of a life is to assert that that life had value, that it was, that it is still holy and singular, woven in the divine image. La kol zaman. There is a time for holding everything. There is a time for tearing and a time for repairing. This has always been our work as a Jewish people, this bearing witness to the brokenness, this striving to stitch together the worlds. On Yom Kippur, we sit with the torn fabric of relationships, with the rifts in our families and communities and our spirits. And on this day, we feel the coming together of generations, past, present, and future, as we perform ancient rituals and hear echoes of our ancestors' worship crossing our lips. We reenact the awe-inspiring rituals of atonement of a world that once was, the cult of the priesthood in the holy temple of Jerusalem that has ceased to exist. We carry the grief of our ancestors who tore their clothing as they lived through the Chorban, the destruction of the temple, the end of their world as they knew it. And it is life affirming the way words are stitched together in our machsor and in the hands that carry them. We are acutely aware of the absence of our loved ones who have died on this day and we seek out and we bring close their continued presence in us. True grief is an expression of praise, of love for that which we have lost. And on this day, grief and praise are woven together. The author Martine Prechtel writes, grief is praise because it is the natural way love honors what it misses. Grief is praise because it is the natural way love honors what it misses. Prechtel says that we know grief and praise intimately from the very beginning. Each child is born grieving the loss of the proximity of the heartbeat of our mother. And Prechtel teaches that this loss is so massive that all of us as newborns utilize the very first inhalation of our lungs to cry out in grief. This life-giving grief wail of a newborn baby is the most profound form of praise for being alive. La kol zman be'eit lechol chefetz tachat hashamayim. A season is set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven. And perhaps not separate times, but a time when it's all right here and spilling over in our hearts. 
a time of weeping and laughing, mourning and dancing, grieving and praising, all in the same breath. Eight likroa, the eight litfor, a time for rending and a time for mending. On Yom Kippur, we show up with our hearts torn open, seeking reunion with God, seeking reconciliation with one another. We sit at the edge of the unknown, hovering in the borderland between life and death. We draw our ancestors close. We allow ourselves to grieve the lives lost, the possibilities lost, the skins shed, the worlds that have died. The day of Yom Kippur calls us to be present in the fullness of our experience, to love what we love, to long for that which we long for, to glimpse and yearn for all that we can yet become. Through expressing our grief and our praise, we begin this work of mending our world. Today, as we recite Yisker, as we move through Musaf's avodah and martyrology services, may we give ourselves permission to feel all the things at once. May we allow the memories of our loved ones to nourish our hearts. And may our hearts stay awake and open. May we be granted the courage to mend and to rend, to tear and to repair, to stitch together the worlds. May the souls of our loved ones be bound up in our lives for all time, and may our names be fastened in the book of life. Gemar Khatima Tova. In just a few moments, we'll move into our Yisker service. As I was preparing this sermon, a song came up on the radio called, Keep Me in Your Heart for a While. And it was a version of the song by the Whale and Jennies. And I was so taken by this song, I did a little research and learned that it was written by a singer and songwriter, Warren Zevon of Blessed Memory. When Warren Zevon learned that he had incurable cancer, he picked up his guitar and he wrote this song intended to be a farewell. His instructions for stitching together the worlds. He sings, you know, I'm tied to you like a button on a blouse. Keep me in your heart for a while. So I'm going to go into the sanctuary um, where we will begin our Yisker service and Yosef and I will uh, sing this song before we enter into the prayers of Yiskor. Shadows are falling and I'm running out of breath. Keep me in your heart for a while. If I leave you, it doesn't mean I love you any less. Keep me in your heart for a while. When you get up in the morning and you see that crazy song, keep me in your heart for a while. There's a train leaving nightly cold when all is said and done. Keep me in your heart for a while. la 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 Keep me in your heart for a while. Sha la 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 Keep me in your heart for a while. Sometimes when you're doing simple things, 
things around the house. Maybe you'll think of me and smile. You know I'm tied to you like the buttons on your blouse. Keep me in your heart for a while. Hold me in your thoughts. Take me to your dreams. Touch me as I fall into you. When the winter comes, keep the fires lit, and I will be right next to you. Engine drivers heading north up to Pleasant Street. I'll be back here at one o'clock to leave. You never be right here. Hard for a while. These wheels keep a turning, but they're running out of steam. Keep me in your heart for a while. la 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 Keep me in your heart for a while. la 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 Keep me in your heart for a while. Keep me in your heart for a while. Keep me 